Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. We are Myth Vision. I have Dr. Reuven Firestone, Firestone joining me again today. How are you? Great. Good. Thank you. I really appreciate right. you joining. Yeah, good. It's good to be here. How are you? How are things going on your end? We just got snow and I don't have four wheel drive. And so getting the car into the driveway, which is a steep hill, that's another topic. Anywho, <laughs> I really do appreciate you joining us today. Your book is a must read that I highly recommend anybody who's interested in the subject diving into Jihad, the origin of holy war in Islam. I haven't been able to put this book down. I recommend anybody who's interested in understanding that because this is the topic today. We're going to ask questions like, what is jihad? What does it even mean, right? Does it always mean war? Of course, your book uh, goes into this. But specifically also engaging in the topic of holy war in the origins of the religion we call Islam. And of course, religious categories are sometimes bad categories. We just use them to try and understand where people are coming from. And it reminds me, your book started making me think of In God's Path by Robert G. Hoyland and why he titled it that. And I feel like, hold on, maybe I solved the mystery because I'm some guy who doesn't even know Arabic. Like in God's path is a phrase that makes sense in war, uh, in the conquest of what we see in early Islam, which categorizes into your book here that we're discussing today. I want to say up front, I want to educate people. I want to give them the good, the bad, the ugly. I want to have people understand the reality of the literature and understand that it's not a one-stop shop. So if you're coming at this with a one-dimensional, I found something ugly, therefore everything has to fit this view, you're not approaching this academically and you're not being fair to the sources, both in exegetes and commentaries over time, but also with the literature of the Quran itself. So we're going to be very carefully analyzing this. And um, Dr. Firestone, how would you want to begin this book? I mean, I could go ahead and start with my questions and we can just dive in, or you can go ahead and um, give us some type of preparation before we do. Yeah, I think uh, what I would like to say is that um, we make a lot of assumptions about things and we, <laughs> we don't understand the context uh, and we don't understand uh, kind of deeply about it. We are easily fooled into thinking something that is simple when it's actually much more complicated. Let me just give you an example of that. Robert Hoyland's book, In the Path of God, the, the phrase, In the Path of God, really has nothing to do with war. I, I, now, I am speaking as a non-Muslim, okay? Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. want everyone to understand. I am speak. I am a, a rabbi. I'm a Jew. I am a practicing Jew. I'm not a Muslim. I have nothing invested in Islam. It's not my religion. So I can look at it neutrally in theory, although there is no actual neutral examination right. of a religion, neither your own nor anybody else's, because we're always in such competition with one another. But I'm not going to try to uh, make Islam into something pretty if it's not pretty. OK, I'm, I really want to be um, quite uh, upfront about that from the beginning. You need to know what you're getting <laughs> in the in the interest of full disclosure. So the term in the path of God, in Arabic, it's fisabili la. Uh, in the path of God simply means whatever you're doing, you're doing it on behalf of God in the community. That's the idea. Not that mm -hmm. God needs our help, if I'm if I were a Muslim and speaking in these terms, but that means like doing righteous deeds, giving charity, taking care of the sick, uh, defending the community. When it's doing it within a framework that is a religious framework that is on behalf of the community, which is overseen or, or observed by God, that's Fisa Bilila. So the Quranic, that's a Quranic term. It occurs, occurs um, quite a bit. And it, a, a lot of the actions that are done in the path of God have nothing to do at all with fighting. Some do, but a lot don't. So mm -hmm. that needs to be clarified, I think. Yeah, and I'm glad we're starting with clarifications as we engage this understanding we all have our bias. Of course, I say up front, like I think that um, religions are constructs of man, perception based on time, culture, environment, you name it. And uh, I take the historical methodology, which kind of assumes a naturalistic uh, tool, 
in which we're working with to try and understand and grasp what happened. Whether someone goes beyond that ontologically, I don't care. I'm interested in the facts, the history, what we can understand. So um, I want to start off. I'm going to be, if that's okay with you, reading quotes from your book to give context and then allow you to like elaborate if that's cool, because I really love this book. Um, often I'll usually reformulate something in my own phrase, like to my own phrases, but this is so well written. I'm like, okay, I've got to get people to go and, and get this book again, shameless plug, get the book Jihad, the origin of Holy war. And we will just for those who are like, why are you talking about Islam? We're also going to deal with uh, holy war in the Hebrew Bible, according to Judaism. So we're going to actually examine that as well. Uh, Judaism might be anachronistic when we're dealing with Hebrew literature, uh, but you get the point. Um, go check out his books. And of course, check out Myth Vision's Patreon. Help support us and educate in the world. I am trying to bridge some gaps and educate people to understand what is going on. Uh, we specifically specialize mostly when it comes to Christianity and of course, Hebrew Bible, but I am trying to expand our horizon here. Okay, now to my question. And the first one is, you say the study of the holy war phenomenon in early Islam is all the more interesting when we take into account the overwhelming evidence that pre-Islamic Arabia knew of no notion of ideological war of any kind, let alone religiously sanctioned war. How and why then did holy war become such a major component of early Islam? And you say this, the problem may be stated most clearly as follows. While there's no evidence of any pre-Islamic expression of religiously sanctioned war, it appears very early in Islam as a highly developed and applied concept. How and why did holy war become such an important item in Islam? Okay, so that that's the question. Right. I mean, that's really sort of the driving question for the book. And... Uh, um, first of all, I, I, we need to talk about terminology a lot. Um, there is no word in, in Arabic, uh, in traditional Arabic writings for holy war. It doesn't exist. It, there is a term, you could, and you can see it today. It's harb is war. Muqaddas means holy. So al-harb al-muqaddas would be holy war. It doesn't exist in Islam. It also doesn't exist in Judaism. There's no... Milchama Kedusha in, in traditional Hebrew literature of any kind, from the biblical period, the Middle Ages, only in the modern period are, do these concepts come into discourse. And the reason they come into discourse is really because it's a reaction to Christianity and to Christian ideas that creep in and that have an impact on these other religious traditions as well. So when I, when I say holy war in Islam, what I mean is, how do we define what is what what makes a war a holy war? And you have to kind of think about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, why would it be holy? Uh, and and my definition is a pretty simple definition, and I use it when I write about Judaism and Islam and Christianity on this topic. And that is, if a community comes to the conclusion that the war that they are fighting is authorized by God, then that's a holy war, period. Now, what does it mean to be authorized by God? God may not have said in the year 1096, go out, you crusaders, and conquer Jerusalem. God never said that. The Pope said that, not God. So what makes that a holy war? Because the Pope is claiming to represent the will of God when he makes a proclamation in such a, an environment. Okay, so that, that could be, you can say that wasn't a holy war. You could say it was driven by political or economic or social or demographic issues. All of these that were affecting what was going on in Europe in the in, in the 11th century, right? But, um, but it's called a holy war because the people believe that for some, through in, directly or indirectly, God is authorizing this engagement, okay? So that's how I look at it also in the Quran. There is no holy war as opposed to non-holy war in the Quran. There is a term for war, and it's not jihad. The term in the Quran for war is harb, not used very often. That's sort of a standard generic term. Or kital, which really means fighting. And the term, there is a term uh, in in going back to our first comment about in the path of God, right? There's there's fighting in the path of God. That would be, I would define that as 
sanctified war authorized by God. Now, you may say that such and such a war is not authorized by God. It's not, this war is not divinely authorized, but that's a matter of opinion about mm -hmm. who, who is engaging in, in the acts or who is the you know, leader in, in, the, in that, that period of time. So I just want to kind of clarify that. So yeah, so in, in the pre-Islamic period in Arabia, there doesn't seem to be any evidence for godly driven wars. But that actually is an interesting observation because that actually applies pretty much to everywhere. That is, before there was a thing that we call monotheism and the world was divided between different communities of people, each community had its own God or its own deity, almost like a mascot in some ways. When, a, when one community went to war with another community, their God also went to war with the, the other community's God. So there was this kind of, there was this kind of tension. And, and the gods did fight. You can read it in the Hebrew Bible. You can yeah. read it in references in Assyrian texts, in, in ancient in Babylonian texts, where gods fight wars for the people, for the Babylonians and for the Assyrians. But, but these are not holy wars. These are just wars in which one ethnic community, you might call it an ethnic community, tribal community, whatever, is fighting another community. Part of that ethnicity is the God. The God belongs to the community. The community belongs, belongs to the God. And so they're all fighting together. Mm -hmm. and, and, and some would draw the conclusion. I'm not talking about scholars. I'm talking about people living at the time. They would draw the conclusion that they won the war because their God is more powerful than the God of the neighbor. Now, in that case, either every war is a holy war or no war is a holy war. Because in all cases where people fight wars, the gods that are associated with the people also fight in those wars. I think but the Hebrew Bible says God is a man of war, actually. In one, in, and then it, that's right. I, I also like Paula Fredrickson's statement about um, – the gods run in the in the blood, right? Like the, there's a connection between the gods and the people. And even with the Jewish people, though they're not genealogically descended from their God, the same way many other people like the Greco-Roman world would say, hey, our father, you know, go far enough back is actually a God. Um, they're adopted, right? So this notion of being adopted by Yahweh and like they actually end up identifying as that's their father because he adopts them. And, and, anyway, I just figure that's an interesting key piece of information as we like move forward. But I, I want to ask, since we've dealt with a few definitions and you point out in the book, we have to start with definitions when we deal with war. Um, jihad, what does jihad mean? And then of course, it seems like it can be applied to many things, including war. Um, maybe we'll start there and then we'll get into maybe understandings. You can tell us of how different Muslims understood this over time. Yeah. So, yeah, so jihad uh, is not the operative term for war in the Quran. The operative term for war in the Quran is a different term. That's where, that's pital, that's fighting. And, and there's fighting, there are all kinds of different kinds of fighting. Uh, but fighting in the path of God would be what I would call holy war, or divinely authorized war. There's also jihad fi sabilila, jihad in the path of God. And that sometimes also refers to war. Sometimes jihad refers to other things. Jihad itself means to struggle or to exert great effort, usually uh, on behalf of something positive against something that's negative. That's the that's the sense of jihad in the Quran. So jihad became an operative. I think this is my opinion now. This uh -huh. is not a fact. That I think that jihad became an operative term in Islam for what we would call holy war, because it actually reflects lots of different kinds of practices that are considered sacred. Uh, in, in, uh, in practices on behalf of the community, as I said earlier, giving charity, required charity, taking care of the, the needy, um, struggling against uh, difficult issues on behalf of the community. That's sort of the, that notion. And since in some cases in the Quran, it does refer to fighting, then later, Quranic, uh, I mean, it, Muslim thinkers kind of read back and said, this is the word that most perfectly expresses 
fighting on behalf of the community for God. And so that became the operative term for what we would call holy war, even though it's used pretty rarely in the Quran uh, right. for war. Usually it's something else is used entirely. But there is plenty of war in the Quran. There's a lot of discussion about war in the Quran. There's discussion about peace in the Quran too, just and, like in all scriptures. And, and exactly. let me, if I may, yes, just, please uh, take a little um, a, a moment for this. I, I, I say this to my students all the time. I say that scripture never says anything about anything. Scripture always says several or maybe many things about anything. That is, there's always a range of perspective that's offered in a in a in an anthology of literature, what scripture is, whether it's the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, or the Quran, it's it's a collection of statements and um, sermons and histories and parables and all kinds of things that are kind of mixed together. And it, it does not, it's not absolutely consistent about mm -hmm. most issues. So for example. In all three of our scriptures, we can cite text, but it would take me a little while to put them together. You're gonna have I, I I always tell my students also don't trust anyone who says scripture says this unless they actually give you the the text. But I, in the interest of time, I can't do that exactly today. But in in the all three of our scriptures, there scripture reflects concern for the world at large. God is concerned for the world, mm -hmm. right? But there are also materials in our scriptures where God is concerned for the community of believers. And, and that's really the center focus, not the world. The world is all messed up. It's the community of believers that God really cares about. And we find that in all of our scriptures. So does that mean that scripture is only parochial and only cares about itself? No, it doesn't. But is, does it only care about the whole world at large and never care about the believers? that are? No, it's not that either. There's always a range. And that same thing applies with war and fighting and conflict resolution. In all of our scriptures, there are cases in which God, uh, we understand that God is saying, we need to resolve these issues, not through fighting, but through other means. And then there are other cases where it looks like God is saying, you need to resolve these issues by fighting them and even killing the mm -hmm. enemy. So uh, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, I like that approach because that is the reality. We have we have a lot of literature, and this is why we have so many interpretations as well. Is there's so many like what does your community want to put at the forefront? What are they drawing the boundaries uh, on scripturally speaking? I also um, want to say this is my little bias poking in again is like the idea that God loves the whole world, and then also there seems to be clear contradictions at times where he doesn't love certain people uh, clearly. It's like, does he love them or not? And so for me, this is a reflection of like, whoever these authors are, we're getting their perception of God. And meaning we're getting the perception of the deity that they're promoting or saying that they represent. So um, to me, it's, it's very, you know, uh, anthropological. It's very man, man orientated. Um, even if it is saying it's divinely orientated. Now that's my bias. I just pointed out. Anyway, I'd like to press forward because you, you said something interesting about jihad. And in your book, you said, when the term is used without qualifiers, such as of the heart or of the tongue, however, it is universally understood as war on behalf of Islam, equivalent to jihad of the sword. And the merits of engaging in such jihad are described plentifully in most respected religious works. Nevertheless, and you point out, Muslim thinkers, and particularly ascetics and mystics, often differentiate between the greater jihad, and I'm going to butcher this, but it's al-jihad al-Akbar, and the lesser jihad, al-jihad al-Asgar, I hope I'm saying that right, with the former representing the struggle against the self, so the greater jihad is really like the major one that they want to say is representative of, of jihad, is like against the self, and only the lesser jihad referring to warring in the path of God. I know this is your opinion versus their opinions, or maybe you have a similar opinion. Do you think that this is somehow uh, uh, the ethics developed over time and mystics and those later are kind of wanting to get away from the more physical uh, warring against other peoples and try to live in peace? And so they're kind of... Um, I don't want to use the word apologetic, but I feel like it's kind of a way of saying, let's redefine this. We really shouldn't live so warlike. What are your thoughts? 
<laughs> that's a good question because um, the, there is a term in this discipline of study of scripture called reception tradition or reception tradition, right? And and what that means is how was scripture received? How was it read by people through history, right? So if you are a religious person, a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, and you're reading your scripture as a religious text, there you are reading it with your own self involved in the process. So there, there is, there's all kinds of research now on how do people read? How do we read whenever we read? We always invest ourselves in the story that we're reading. We, we read it from our own perspective, from our own context, our own issues, our own emotions at the time. And, and all of us have experienced reading something. It could be, I don't know, a, a, a psalm that uh, after uh, having a, 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 a wonderful experience of having a new baby, we read this same psalm and suddenly it has a new meaning. Or we lose a loved one and we read the same psalm and suddenly that has a new meaning that we didn't know before because our context, our life, our emotional place always infuses meaning into whatever we read. Now that has always been the case and it's the way people read. So in let's just deal with Islam now because I, I like thinking about this and always comparatively, but let's- I'm let's with you. Islam. I am, and, and can I say why I think we do that is to be fair, to show you that we're willing to do that to other scriptures. And I think that's a great approach in comparing it. Anyway, right. I'm, I'm with you. I love it. And I should just mention that the reason that I wrote a book called Holy War in Judaism is because I wrote a book called Holy War in Islam. And I felt that <laughs> it wasn't fair to me for me to write a critical examination of this phenomenon in another religion if I'm not doing the same thing in my own tradition. And Thank that's you. what actually brought me there. But but let's go back to the topic. Okay. So So the Quran reflects, the actual Quran itself reflects a relatively short period in human history. It's about 23 years during the life of the prophet Muhammad when he was receiving revelations from God. Now, whether he was really receiving revelations or whether he was really a prophet, to me, doesn't really matter. I'm not not concerned about that. I want to. I don't want to prove yes. I don't want to prove no. But the the Quran itself is articulated as a series of revelations, and it reflects the geopolitical and the contextual historical situation at the time. So that was around somewhere around six early 600s, okay, up to about 632, right? So 610 or something like that, 632. And uh, during that time, the Muslim community, that is the community that was following Muhammad, um, was was countered be because they were threatening to other established communities that were already there. Um, the, the most serious threat to the early Muslims were Arabs who were practicing indigenous polytheistic Arabian religion. And when Muhammad said, you should get rid of your idols because they're not going to help you, that was threatening to people who really loved their idols and were associated with that religious tradition. So there was pushback and it started out kind of benign, just arguing. And you can kind of, at least some people say that the Quran really reflects this historically. And there were cases when it became really nasty and there was a lot of violence uh, directed against the Muslim community and the Muslim community responded in kind when it had the power to do so. So this is also a complicated issue, which is dealt with in some detail in the book. So if you're interested in the details, you can you can read the book. The um, that in my view, the Quran does not ever call for conquest. The Quran itself, not the reception history of the Quran, but the Quran for what it's actually saying it's in its own context, seems to be calling for defense of the community. And then in some cases, expansion of the community and punishing those who were trying to destroy it. So it's not only defensive war in the Quran. It's a lot of defensive war, but sometimes it's initiating war against those people who were trying to undermine the, the, the life of the prophet and the people who uh, are following him. Mm -hmm. But it's, it never calls for like world conquest. It never says to uh, take over other um, communities. It's really very centered around the idea of Arabia. It doesn't talk about, about 
the Holy Land. It doesn't talk about Iran, North Africa, the rest of the world. But that material was read later mm -hmm. because there was a successful conquest, which I don't think was driven so much by the Quran. A little bit, maybe. But the, but the conquest happened. And some, some historians believe it was almost an accident because the, the this gets complicated, but the great empires at the time, the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire, were exhausted from fighting each other for two generations. And they were like, could hardly even stand on their feet. And so when these Arabian um, warriors came out and they sort of tested the waters to see if they could capture some more land, not for God, not for conversion, but just for control, power, wealth, uh, they were immensely successful. And, and that continued for a generation, two generations, a hundred years. So when, when you then control people, and remember these guys who, who took over this area, we're talking about a conquest where a hundred square miles a day of territory was, was conquered for a hundred years. Mm. All of North Africa, up into Spain. It was just, it was amazing. And but the people that they conquered were not Muslims and they didn't convert to Islam and they were not forced to convert to Islam. And the Muslim community that was in control was a minority community. And they were actually anxious about living among all these people that they had conquered because they would rise up against them and kill them. They, they even established what they called Ansar, these kind of communities or cities outside of the major areas so that they could protect themselves from the local population. So here's the situation. You conquer someone and you have the power and you take the palaces and everybody else has to live in the hovels and you're in the, you, you've got all this, uh, you know, this great wealth and you're accumulating wealth. You might be trying to govern people nicely, but sure you conquered, you lost a lot of people. It was, it was painful. You deserve to get the wealth and the riches. And that's always has happened with all conquests at all times, including today. So, so then they're in, in an interesting situation. The, the Muslims are in a position of control and everybody else is in a position of being subdominant to the Muslim community. And, and th that works when, you're, when you first conquer because you're overwhelming them with your power. But then after a generation or two, people start saying, why does he have to get to live up on the hill and we have to live down here in this stinky valley where it's, uh, you know, the waters are are not clean and, and they're living where the air is good and they have, they're in the palaces. There's nothing inherently um, uh, natural about that. I want to live in the palace. And so I think that Muslim readers of the Quran began in their reception history, began to read into the Quran, this notion of conquest and that God really wants the community of people to be in control, not to force people to Islam, because that is not part of the conquest. Conquest is political control, not forcibly converting people. There were cases where people were forcibly converted, but that was exceptional. So, so I, okay. I believe that there is what I call a, an imperialist interpretive overlay that's sort of placed on the Quran to justify conquest and that became codified in Islamic histories and legal literature, but it's not really in the Quran. It's it's very, you know, we do analogies, right? I think the same thing in a different area can be described of Christianity, uh, doctrine of the Trinity, um, if we're doing theology, or some other thing becomes codified as the interpretive method for Orthodox Christianity. Um, I imagine just war theory when they actually start to try and find a way, <laughs> well, we got to get rid of these people or we've got to handle this. Uh, how do we do it and not turn the other cheek, which will cause us to be annihilated. Oh, we got to find a way. Well, we've got the Hebrew scriptures. We've got these words from Christ. In fact, he is going to come back with a sword. He's going to destroy all people. Uh, maybe they find some way. Um, I wanted to backtrack because we went really far um, into the future back to the context this is what I love about your book. It's about, it's not about, you mentioned, you know, two, three, four centuries after the Quran's development of uh, the, theologians, exegetes, medieval um, exegetes and others, how they're interpreting things. You mentioned these things, 
But I think your whole focus and goal ultimately is like, what is the Quran saying? What is going on? And you show the wrestle, the wrestling within the exegetes and scholars of Islam as they can't even agree in early communities for the first four or five centuries, can't even agree on many of these issues that we're talking about, kind of like the early church couldn't agree on Jesus's Christology and things. Mm -hmm. um, I want to bring it back to give some context before Islam rises. And this yeah. is my question. Um, Arabian foot fatalism. And I, I wanted to phrase it in, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Arabian fatalism or the idea of fate. I used fatalism, kind of the notion that like it is what it is. What happens is what happens. You can't escape death. Death is our fate. Um, and war. And maybe we can tie that into, I'm wondering if this idea of rewards for your death and getting heaven and things like this that comes with dying uh, in combat or overcoming in combat. I see this martyrdom idea in Christianity where a martyr or someone who dies goes directly to heaven for their faith. Do you think that influence is there? So we went from pre-Arabia, fate. How does that maybe play into warfare? And is there any influence, you think, from Christianity's martyrdom concepts into warfare as well within early Islam? Right. Well, we don't know a lot about pre-Islamic religion because it was really suppressed by the Muslim historians. They they wanted to paint a picture of the pre-Islamic period as a time of terrible ignorance until God gave the revelation of the Quran to bring light to this community and realize the truth of monotheism and and uh, perhaps a coming apocalypse. But the notion of reward and punishment in a, in a world to come, that doesn't seem to have been uh, very much a part of pre-Islamic Arabian religious tradition. Although there were Jews and Christians living in Arabia that did believe in the idea of reward and punishment in the world to come. So it's, it's complicated. It's hard to kind of parse out what was influencing what at the time. Mm. But, but the Quran really does say several times that uh, people who die if they're fighting in the path of God. Now, what does in the path of God mean? It doesn't mean conquest. It doesn't mean defense. It just means in the path of God. It so could be any gonna, of those. It could yeah, be all of them. Right? That's right. So how are you going to how are you going to make sense of that? But people who do fight in the path of God, and if they are killed, they will have uh, eternal life. They will go immediately to heaven. So that's that's there in the Quran, and that that follows um, a Christian martyrology positions that if you die in the path of God, like being being uh, faithful to your faith, then you will go to heaven as well. So it, it it's less it's less aggressive in the early Muslim literature. It's not aggressive at all. But later on in the Crusader period it becomes very aggressive. Mm -hmm. And and the reason I, I keep jumping away from Islam is because if we only look at one religious tradition we think that that's where it's all at, and it's not. Right. We're influencing right. one another. I at agree. the height of the militancy in Christianity, killing a person would actually be an act of atonement for other sins of greed or, uh, or uh, what is it, um, uh, lust, lusting after someone or rape. And you kill an enemy, you'll actually atone for your other sins from killing someone. And that seems like crazy. Mm -hmm. It's not certainly not New Testament. It's not early church fathers, but um, but then it becomes that. So it, it's that way in the Quran, too. In the Quran, it's earlier because Islam became more militant earlier than Christianity. Sometime we should really talk about Christianity because Christianity starts out as a quietist religion, a non-militant tradition. But it changes radically mm -hmm. from non-militants to extreme militants. And one of the questions that I ask in a course that I teach called Holy War in History is what makes a religion change its viewpoint so radically? In the it, Christianity changed from quietism to militarism. Ancient Judaism changed from militarism to quietism. <laughs> and now it looks like it may be changing back into more militarism right. again. At so, least in certain areas of the world. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. 
So these are questions. I just want to complicate things a little bit. It's oh, I love that you're com. I love how complicated you are. I'm telling you, because this is great. It's a great topic. Um, I'm with you. Let's talk about that at some point as well. And and in fact, I'm actually planning on doing an interview on Christian nationalism from a scholar who's kind of going into that. Because to be honest with you, look at how much warmongering is on the side of Christian nationalists in America, right? Yeah. That This promotion for warfare and stuff. Funny how Christianity just fits hand in glove with war in modern America for many evangelicals. So that's a whole another topic um, that I think we could dabble into as we explore Christianity and how violent it really gets. I love that you do that because it's like the, not one tradition has all the sins, so to speak. They all have it. They're all guilty, everybody. And um, to some degree, right? So you got to check yourself and check your own community and try to find um, balance. Now I, I wanted to bring up the idea of pre-Arabian uh, pre-Islamic Arabian uh, tribes that would kind of go and raid each other. It was actually known, according to what you described in the book, like it was like um, encouraged. And in fact, you were like a better tribe for going and like raiding and taking the stuff of other people and, you know, selling off their women and children and things like that. Like it was kind of, I don't want to be derogatory, but barbaric. Right. And you, it seems that way. Of course, we're not in that culture. Now, if we were back then, and if it was us, of course, we wouldn't want that to be us being called barbaric. But in according to our ethics, the way we try to live today, like the, this was encouraged to go and raid and do these things. And um, Islam comes on the scene and you describe the idea. And I love how you get into this one term. I can't remember the term. I'd have to pull up the reference. But you point out how there's like there was darkness. But is this ignorance of being pagan? Is it darkness because of the paganism or is it darkness because there was no standard legal governance on how to behave and act as a religious government governing rather than just community tribal distinct distinctions between small little groups and stuff. And there's not really any law and order, so to speak. Can you dabble into that a little bit? Yeah. The, it seems, as far as we know, right, everything is is controversial because how much do we know about the culture in ancient periods of time? What kind of evidence do we have to really buttress our, our assumptions about the culture? But it seems in the pre-Islamic Arabian context, there was no overarching government. There was no political rule in Arabia. Arabia was ruled by various tribal communities that had their own systems and, and as you said, if their neighboring tribal community was too weak or too irresponsible to take care of their flocks, they don't deserve to have their flocks. We can take their flocks. And so you could raid your next door neighbor as, if, as long as it's not a member of your tribe or your extended tribe, right? Because there's kinship identity. And these were small-ish groups of people who were in conflict with one another. Now, I want to complicate this a little bit. <laughs> we do something like this today in the nation state. If another nation state is too weak, we can begin to dominate their economy. We can control access to markets. We can take their natural resources. We can, we can do this. And, 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 and so the mentality is not all that different from mm -hmm. the pre-Islamic or pre empire uh, world. It's just, it, it's much smaller context, right? So yeah, so that was the way, that was the way it went. And, and the culture of pre-Islamic Arabia was one that was very ethnic or tribal, let's say tribal. Okay. So you knew everybody who was in your tribe and you, in addition to your tribe, well, what is a tribe? I mean, there's a, there's a family, a nuclear family, an extended family, <clears throat> maybe a clan. There's a, few couple of extended families that are together and then a few clans were together and they're a tribe and then a bunch of tribes maybe get together and form a tribal federation the farther you are away from your mother's family or your mother and father's family the less you know them the less you have a relationship with them the less you feel responsible for them or feel that they're responsible for you not so different than what we have today you know and so so that was the way it worked. Now, one of the perhaps the one of the most brilliant things that Muhammad did 
to unify this warring multi-ethnic, multi-tribal community of Arabians was to redefine the notion of tribe and to say, no, it's not just who you're born to. It's not just by chance. We, we who believe in this one God, we are a new tribe. We're a tribe of believers. The term that's used is umma. Umma means the, the community or tribe of believers. And, and by, by saying to everybody, you don't have to fight each other all the time. We can be friends with one another because we're under the one God who wants us to act and behave in a reasonable way, moral, ethical, kind of ethical monotheism. And then we can resolve all these kind of conflicts that we had before between one another, killing each other and raiding one another. And, and when you did raid in the pre-Islamic period, if you, heaven forbid, you killed somebody from the other side, then they would have to kill someone back on your side because there was no police force. There was no legal system that, was trans, that transcended the tribal boundaries. And so that was the way it worked. But under the Islamic system, there was God who was the ultimate judge and God was represented by his prophet, Muhammad. And so that was a way to resolve disputes and bring all these disparate communities together. And that succeeded. And that's one of the reasons why Islam became so successful. Okay, this is, there's so many interesting things that you said there that came to mind as well about tribal, ethnic, however you want to describe it here. And even the way it goes out after Muhammad dies, uh, I'm reminded of the book by Leslie Hazelton. It's a fun Shi'i Sunni split uh, book, really well read or well written, um, where you have family ties that are trying to say, hey, it, keep it in the family. We're supposed to pass this baton off, the baton to the next generation of descendants or family members and the others are going no 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 it's it's community it's not clan related it's not tribalistic and so you do find like this still uh, alive when he when he's done when he's gone um let's see it, it, that it, that plagues the muslim community even to this day mm -hmm. because there are lots of ethnic divisions between muslims uh, just in the big in the big picture arab muslims versus turkish muslims versus Persian Muslims, and there are cultural differences, but that's the way people are. People just, they divide themselves over cultural issues, what you feel more comfortable with and who you feel more comfortable being with. Yeah. And by the way, I, I imagine our sources are kind of, they're not great sources, but the earliest sources we have are Paul, but Paul's engaging with James and, and Kephas over in Jerusalem. And I wouldn't be surprised. I kind of take the notion that James is kind of a caliphate of, uh, of Jesus. He's a, he's carrying that baton. And of course, Christianity radically changes uh, when it expands over time, post-war, uh, all of this with Gentile inclusion, the whole nine. So like, uh, I wouldn't be shocked if it was a family thing as well with Jesus. And Anyway, that's a whole nother can of worms, but I want to compare. As we've been doing in this episode, I want to show that we aren't just zeroed in on one thing. It's everybody's got uh, something that we can try to relate to here as, as far as the Abrahamic faiths go. Uh, you say, as Islam continued to evolve after the collection and redaction of the Quranic revelations, some of the pre-Islamic artifacts retained in scripture disturbed later generations. Quranic exegesis attempted, among other things, to mitigate or eliminate some of these in their interpretations of Scripture. Chapter 3 examines a field of Quranic interpretation that adjusted the meaning of Scripture in order, in order for it to convey a message more appropriate for an evolving worldview. And I imagine that means to their contemporary setting. So what are some of the things that are, are can I use the word archaic, um, pre-Islam, pre that is in the Quran that later uh, exegetes had a problem with? <laughs> um, it's a good question. I, um, I don't, I don't, uh, nothing has come to mind. At this, I didn't get you moment. prepared for this. That's the problem. <laughs> I hit you out of nowhere with this one, but. Uh... Yeah. Um, oh, well, I, I the, the, the Quran, I'm not, I'm not sure if this, uh, uh, so we're talking about how the Quran deals with pre-Islamic material or how does post-Quranic interpretation deal with Quranic views of pre-Islamic material? Right, right. That's the one I was trying to get at is like, what ah. were some of the things we would call them um, 
embarrassments, right? That Christian, like, look at the gospel of Mark. Mark sees Jesus as baptized and literally for the remission of sins. Matthew mm. can't have that. Jesus did not sin. He's sinless. Like how the heck could he be baptized for sins when he's yeah. sinless? So you kind of see redactions or changes or problems. And so ooh, we need to back up from that one. Do you see, and sometimes it's, it's, they go all into it, but they reinterpret the meaning. Do you think, are there things like that in the Quran yeah. that you For can sure. think of? Yeah. I mean, here's a, here's a classic example. The Quran has, has three, three references to drinking alcohol. One reference. Now I don't know if I have this exactly right. But one reference says it's probably not such a good idea. Another reference says, don't drink if you're going to pray, right? Don't don't drink before you pray. And then the third reference says drinking is a bad thing. if It's associated with other bad things. Hmm. So, all right. So the Quran seems to be responding to a problem. The problem was the problem that every community has with alcohol which is if you drink too much or if you drink unwisely, if you drink irresponsibly, it's bad for you, your family, and the community in general, right? But the Quran doesn't really outlaw it. It says, it has three different positions on it. Now, that didn't sit well with later exegetes or, or Muslims because they, because if God is all-knowing and God is just, then why would God give different answers that that doesn't make any sense so we have to protect the our view of god on the one hand and secondly we have to deal with this issue of alcohol and so and and what looks like contradiction within the text of the quran and in order to resolve that problem a methodology was developed not just for this problem but for a lot of other problems because remember what i said a scripture never says one thing about anything it says many things about everything so in this case um, it was determined or it was understood or it was suggested, that's probably the better word, that the early references to drinking in the Quran said it's not so bad, but as it became clear to the community that it's not a good idea, the last reference in the Quran said don't drink. And that reference abrogates the references earlier. You can't get rid of the earlier material because it's God's word, so it's there in the Quran. But you can say that the last reference is the one that's determinant. That determines the position, the, the policy. Fine, that solves the I think we lost Dr. Firestone. Bear with me here. Uh, I'm loving this. We're getting an abrogation, of course, which is... Later, uh, surahs abrogate or negate earlier ones, or there's like an update where something changes earlier. Uh, this is very interesting for people who are watching who've never um, examined the Quran or even read it. If you go to read it, you'll feel like you're out of place over and over and over. Like, well, what's the meaning of this? What's going on here? Um, and there's a lot going on here. So Let's hope he was not raptured, uh, as, as Dan Smith says in the chat. Um, I know he'll come back. Give him just a moment here. I need to give him uh, need to give him my number so he can actually contact me whenever this stuff happens. But uh, let's wait. Let's wait for uh, Dr. Firestone because I have many other notes. We're getting into some of the juicy stuff and interesting parts of his book. And it gets down into the weeds of early exegetes and who says what and about what and how they get to these warlike material and interpreting this war material. And it's really interesting the way that we've been describing it thus far, getting up to the context of what is the Quran engaging in in Arabia? What is the issue between Medinans and Mecca? And, and where is where is Muhammad at? Is he still in Mecca? Has he made it to Medina? Is he in power yet? Is he not? And like the way that exegetes are trying to explain abrogated text and things, it is complicated. I must tell you, it is very complicated. It is not simple and just, ah, anyone should just get it. And no wonder there's so many views and so many people out there who are saying things about this. So I definitely um, hope that he pops in here in just a moment. Maybe his computer died. 
maybe. Hold on. Waiting for him to email me if he if he is going to make it back. I hope everybody's doing good in the chat. Um, Mojo says, uh, did you read the whole Quran? I have read through the whole Quran. And I plan on reading through it more like I do critically with the New Testament, of course, the Hebrew Bible. But, um, but you know, your first go through, you're like, whoa, like some moments I had to reread stuff to try and get what it is. And um, it's not simple. So I imagine people need commentaries or the tafsir to understand the context by different people. And they don't agree on what's always happening in the context and when in, in history these things happen, which is interesting to me. It's just interesting to see this. So um, I am interested in covering um, specific verses that we're going to get into that are oftentimes quoted as defensive passages or even offensive passages and what the meaning of them in the original context may have been understood to mean, all of that will be discussed here. We're just waiting for Dr. Firestone. Um, feel free to super chat your questions, of course, and we will get to them in q and I'm looking forward to that, seeing what kind of questions come up from our audience. And let's see what we have here. Here he is. He was raptured. Right, <laughs> I was, uh, the, there are people, uh, we don't have heat. I, uh, I arranged for people to come an hour after this was supposed to be over, they came early and they <laughs> off the electricity. <laughs> That's what happened. I got to get you my number. If ever anything ever happens, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. I so. just sent you an email with my number for you to okay. call me if you weren't able to get back on. Sorry about that. Hey, no problem. No problem. Um, you're, you're still here. I almost said he had a living apotheosis, but that's <laughs> off topic. So, um, you know, maybe we can start getting into some of the statements that you've made here. And I, I, I figure why not read some of your amazing book to get some context, if that's cool with you. Sure. Um, in one passage, this is going to sound like it's taken out of context. Trust me, read the book. He he's very balanced in this. The most often cited verses express a highly ideological approach to war. They are understood to command unlimited war against non-Muslims enjoin the killing of idolaters and refuse to offer peace until Islam is a uh, hegemonic religion is the hegemonic religion. And then yeah, that, I think the point is, is you're going to, you rightly share. There are some people who want to say these passages in the Quran, and we're going to get into the context more. I, I'm going to read it to you too. So, that you know, like we'll get into the surah. We'll, we'll mention some of these things, but there are people who want to paint, all of this literature is completely warlike. Every there's just like almost an inhumane approach to this literature. And then there are those who kind of come at it so apologetically that there's nothing here that is even remotely, you know, something that we would say, ooh, not something we should probably live by or something we should practice. Um, and you mentioned abrogation, which is something we're getting into as we discuss this. This makes it even more complicated to me and more difficult to get to or ascertain what the context really is when this sir is written or said uh, in the life of Muhammad. So um, can I continue reading something here or did you want to make a comment about that? No, sure. That, that's fine for you to read. I'm, I'm thinking about some comments, but. Okay. That's I good. don't want to take away your comments because no, by no, the time you hear good. the next thing read, this yeah. is a little long-winded, but it's worth it. And, and this is on this chapter, the Quran, the traditional reading and its inherent weakness. The Quran has much to say about warring. And at first sight, it views its views seem to be quite at variance from what we know of pre-Islamic Arabian views. The most often cited verses express a highly ideological approach to war. They are understood to command unlimited war against non-Muslims, enjoin the killing of idolaters, and refuse to offer peace until Islam is the hegemonic religion. The Quran message on the topic, however, is actually far from consistent. So you're now showing like that understanding of it is just not being fair balanced, understanding it's complicated. The verses on warring are numerous, amount to scores in number, and are spread out over more than a dozen chapters. The major challenge for understanding their meaning lies in the problem of verse relationships and the fact that the context of many pronouncements remain uncertain. As noted above, for example, it is difficult to know whether a verse is supposed to be read in relation to the verse, the verses among which it is currently situated. And this is 
audience, please understand this. This is very important as we're diving into the Quran to understand this, this stuff. So is it supposed to be read in the relation to the verses among which it is currently situated, the verses before or after, or whether it should be read independently, almost like here's just this pericope out of nowhere like the Gospel of Thomas. It is likely given the relatively large collection of sometimes unrelated verses on warring in Surahs 2, 3, 8, and 9, for example, that individual statements on war, which had been separated from their context during the oral stage of the Quran, were inserted into larger sections treating the topic because of the obviously similar similarity of subject matter. So rather than it being a narrative, it's like, hey, this is talking about war. Well, we're going to put other pericopes that talk about war, sound like they're talking about war in the same context. Um, the insertion of such verses sometimes confuses the meaning and relationship of the verse into which they had been inserted. Some Quranic statements may or may not even refer to war, depending on how one views their context, verses before and after, but are, or even like, when was this, when was this said? In what part of Muhammad's life? Where, what, is he fighting against the Medinans? Is there a war going on between them and the other Quraysh, et cetera, et cetera, but are nevertheless considered by post-Quranic tradition as articulating divine pronouncements on the subject. The sentiments, ideologies, concepts, and attitudes expressed by the many verses cover a wide range of positions. Some such as Surah 16.125 call for what appears to be non-militant means of propagating or defending the faith. Summon to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good admonition and argue against them with, with what is better. For your Lord, your Lord knows best who has strayed from his path and who has been guided. Others, such as Surah 2239 through 40, seem to sanction fighting for defensive purposes only. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of this, but I, I wanted to show the complexity in explaining the issue we're dealing with when we're reading the Quran and like context. And you can't just read it like I'm reading John chapter 5 and I'm just reading the this, this whole chapter you can, but you're not, you know what I mean? This is not that easy. It's yeah. not just a story. Yeah. So let me try to explain how this works. The revelation of the, the Quran is um, laid out, not according to chronology. Now, the Gospels work with a certain chronology, right? I mean, right. Uh, you know, it leads up until the final end of Jesus's life. So you've got to actually have a movement. It's a story. The Hebrew Bible has a, a chronology throughout, beginning with creation and then ending with the destruction of the temple and a dispersion. And, it, and <laughs> interestingly enough, the Christian version of the Hebrew Bible and the Jewish version of the Hebrew Bible have a different order of books and it actually has a slightly different narrative and it actually has a theological difference based on that different different organization right but we won't go there right now okay? because, <laughs> right so but it, but the Quran has no no chronology whatsoever you can pick up any portion of the Quran and start reading it and you're in the same place. You don't know what came first, what came next. There are stories, there are individual stories in the Quran that have their own narrative, like the story of Joseph, for example, which is quite similar to the story of Joseph is found in the Hebrew Bible, right? But the Quran itself does, as a whole, does not. So you don't know, you cannot tell from the location in the Quran when a verse was revealed or if it was revealed earlier or later in relation to other verses. So in order to figure out which came first and, and which came second, which was important because of the reason I explained earlier, the later verses, if there's a difference in, if it looks like there's a contradiction or mm -hmm. a conflict between different revelations in the Quran, all you need to do is find out which is the latest revelation. And that's the one that you follow. That's the one that takes precedence. Okay. So in the case of war, we talked about that in the case of alcohol. In the case of war, you have the same issue. You have some verses that, as you read, are, you know, let's problem solve through beautiful preaching and not get into conflict, right? That We don't need to do that. And some verses are extremely militant and say, kill, the, kill them wherever you find them. And, you know, because they're trying to push you out, so you push them out, stuff like that. So... How do you know which one you're supposed to follow? Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the Quran does not tell you. And so the 
thinkers, Muslim religious thinkers, in order to try to find out what should be the standard practice or the standard position on war, came up with this understanding, a way to chronologize all of these parts of the Quran that are not found in any chronological order. And in doing so, they argue, and this is what I call the imperialist interpretive overlay. They argue that God told Muhammad in the, in the community of Muslims not to fight at the beginning. They were weak. They had no, they couldn't protect themselves. And if they would have fought back against people who were insulting them and, and in even beating them, then they would have been destroyed and, and they would have failed. So God said, don't fight. And then as they became increasingly more powerful and more confident, God gave them more sanction to engage in more militant behavior until at the very end of Muhammad's career as a prophet, God said, go out and fight them, conquer, control, take over, and, and, to, and don't stop until the word of God becomes the dominant word in the world. And there's a verse that that will support that, All right? So that's that's the that has been the kind of dominant position in Islam. Now I argue that that position developed simply because Muslims were in that position where they needed to justify control over so many different people, and that this is God's will that we're in control over you, Christians and Jews and atheists and other people, and we need to stay vigilant and stay militaristic so that we can continue to be a great and powerful empire. But that's not in the Quran. I argue that maybe we could read the Quran in different ways. Now, first of all, why do I say that that, that interpretive strategy is not, 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 not correct? Because if you look at the different Quran scholars who place the different verses in their chronological order, you'll find that they can't agree about anything. That's what you, you do right. really well of that, yeah. And so, since they can't agree then it's not clear that that was even the case in the first place. So mm. I say you can't rely on that. You, you know, it might be true. I'm not saying it's not true, but you can't rely on it. But which one's true, right? Like, right. Right. Yeah. Who's, which came first? So I, I suggest that you could read these verses as reflecting different positions within the early Muslim community. Some verses supported factions in the community that were extremely militant. And some verses supported factions in the community that were quietist, that were anti-militant. There might have even been pacifist communities in the in that early Muslim community. We know from the formation of Christianity and Judaism that there are always different factions within the community, different people who have different positions on things, and they're they're always jousting with one another over who would become which position would be be the dominant, the orthodox position, the, the position that should be pushed. And the same thing happened in Islam. What, what often happens in these cases is that the more militant positions win out because they're willing to risk more in order to push their position. Mm, that so makes a my, lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, in my view, the more militant position worked out, won out in Islam, but it only won out after it was already, the conquest already had happened. It's and funny because the reverse, the reverse is actually the case in Judaism, especially around the turn of the first second century because you you know if you're gonna survive with rome <laughs> you have to play the opposite of the war battle con like it, it's funny how that worked historically where rabbinic judaism you know really survived because they were like we've got to comply there's got to be some type of complying here because they weren't the head honchos so to speak and if they were then maybe they would have been and that would have been history and we'd have been like look uh, they you know they conquered like the muslims conquered but um, it's interesting the reverse took place. The Jews who did not fight against uh, are really the ones who won history in that time. If that makes but, sense. but one could also argue that's because all the leaders were killed by the Romans, including the rabbis. There were rabbinic mm -hmm. leaders. Rabbi Akiva, who was this great and very powerful, beloved leader right. of the rabbinic community, was a militant. And he, he supported this militant messianic uh, general. And uh, the general was killed and uh, Akiva was killed. So yeah, they had uh, queens with, yeah. <laughs> so the, the survivors were those who had a different narrative and they were the one who became the ones who became dominant and they kind of retooled Judaism from a biblical militaristic 
expression to a quietest rabbinic expression. That's interesting. And we're going to definitely get into that in that episode about your book uh, uh, on, you know, holy war, right? In Judaism. Um, getting back to your book, and you said this, so I'm clarifying what you're saying here. In the case of warring, for example, does is Islamic scripture prescribe avoidance of violence and propagating and defending the faith? Surah 16, 125. Defensive wars only, Surah 22, 39 through 40. Or unrestricted warfare, Surah 9, 5. The theological and political implications regarding such seemingly indecisive or scattered divine pronouncements greatly disturbed Muslim sco religious scholars, and they sought to organize the revelation in a way that would provide clarity to this issue as well as other difficult issues. Um, we talked about abrogation, and then it said, you say this, this is, I love this, using the methodologies developed in both, and I'm going to mispronounce this, correct me here, Asbab? Asbab, the, yeah, Asbab, Asbab and Nizul, yeah. Okay, in the Asbab and Nizul materials, Muslim scholars came to the conclusion that the scriptural verses regarding war were revealed in direct relation, catch this everybody, in direct relation to the historic needs of Muhammad during his prophetic mission. At the beginning of his prophetic career, as you described in Mecca, when he was weak and his followers were few, the divine revelations incurred, encouraged avoidance of physical conflict. They're not strong enough to win anyway, so why would we just to go to suicide and die? Only after the intense physical persecution that resulted in the immigration, Hijra, of the Muslim community to Medina in 622 were Muhammad and the believers given divine authority to engage in war and only in defense. As the Muslim community continued to grow in numbers and strengthen Medina, further revelations widened the condition and narrowed the restrictions under which war could be waged until it was concluded that war against non-Muslims could be waged virtually at any time without pretext and in any place. Yeah, that's the reception history. That's how it was understood um, after, right? Right. And I just clarify, like, you know, you might read a passage, and I find this a lot when you engage online, where Muslims go, no, 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 we're supposed to, you know, be nonviolent, and, and they'll find the surahs that uh, are within the context of the Quran. And I encourage the peace, right? I'm all like, yeah, of course. Um, but you do have certain groups that are militant that are actually out there using the uglier verses i'll call them uh to subjugate or to go and conquer and to say no we're supposed to fight and kill uh, on behalf and these are where we get these extremist ideas but it's not like one size fits all we have to we have to be able to differentiate and not paint everybody in the same category um this gets into the extremist groups that are out there and uh that's jumping ahead but my question is like there are many Muslims I hear say, no, they are misunderstanding and they are not uh, properly reading the Quran in context or they're butchering the historical context to make it fit their militaristic approach, their political militaristic approach. What do you say to that? Yeah, so from a, from a purely um, un, unconnected, disconnected, I guess you could say kind of so-called scholarly view, um, the, how do you uh, how do you determine what a scripture is actually saying? You you can't make that determination. You you everything everything is a narrative. Everything is the way people read. Remember, we talked about reading. You read yourself into the text. If 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 the way I I sometimes teach this is something similar to what I said earlier. That is, if you if you're really angry, you're really angry and you're really upset because people have been really mean to you and your family. Your family might be starving or you may have been abused and you're gonna resonate probably, not necessarily, but you might resonate more with those verses that say, kill the bastards mm -hmm. uh, in any scripture, right? So you, you're, you're gonna feel like you don't have a fair deal in life. There are bad guys out there. Your life is really rough. And you really are resenting it and you're angry and and you can find verses that will support that position. If you are um, living a pretty happy life and pretty generally feeling good about things with yourself, you're going to resonate with the happy verses. That's just sort of how it happens. So so there are in every community, there are people who are really 
um, who are suffering and there are people who are really treated poorly and people who for whatever reasons are reading verses in a, in a different way than other people. And so who has the right to say that's the true read or not? I mean, every, that's contentious. And, and, and this is where we, we, we deal with the problem of who controls the narrative, mm. the narrative. And, and today in the Muslim world, there are various narratives that are being jostled about and in competition with one another over what does God really demand of the Muslim community in the world vis-a-vis -vis other people, Jews, Christians, uh, polytheists, um, other, other people. And some who are very militant are pointing to the militant verses, and some who are acquiescent are uh, pointing to those verses, and others are pointing to different sets of verses. So that's just the way it works. And I don't believe from my own research that the Quran is as militant as Al-Qaeda or ISIS proponents would say. And I don't think the Quran or the Hadith literature, for that matter, that is another authoritative literature in Islam that, to, that has a big in fact, influence on, uh, on behavior. I don't think that they are um, so militant as these militant uh, people would suggest. Um, so, and, and there are people who are pushing back against that narrative. Lots of Muslims are pushing back against that narrative and saying that's not the case. And that mm -hmm. a, a classic ex example of that is the is the controversy over what's the real jihad, what's the greater jihad, is the greater jihad militancy going out and actually fighting wars and battles, or is the greater jihad fighting and struggling against your own evil inclination in your own soul. And there is a, a famous hadith, which it turns out is not so authentic, probably, which says that when the warriors came back from a raid and they came back to the prophet and they said, um, oh, we're, it, was, it was tough, but we got it. We made it and we're back. And, and then uh, Muhammad says to them, well, you just came back from the lesser jihad. Now is the time to think about the greater jihad. And then they would say, well, what's the greater jihad? We were just risking our lives for the community and to get spoils and to do these things that we were supposed to do. What's greater than that? You know, what's more risky than that? And he said, battling your own evil inclination, the evil part inside your own soul. So um, that, that, that's, that's, that's a controversy today over, over what is the, is the true meaning of jihad. Right. I love how you painted that. And yeah, I hope that uh, the th th that gets further and further away from the thinking. Uh, I'd love to have a more peaceful world. At the same time, I think it's important to point out looking at the Quran and trying to understand in the historical context these examples that are set, where they're set in history. See, I'm a big fan of trying to understand what something maybe had meant to the people originally. And that would help, I would think, solve a lot of problems, um, fights, wars, things like that. We could understand the context in which this stuff is written. And I'm wondering if the Quran, based on what we've been talking about, how later narratives are spun and developments are made to try and wrestle with contradictions and abrogations and, you know, what's the deal? I'm wondering if, if we put Muhammad the sayings that are coming in the Quran from Muhammad that are revelations in his context in the Hijra and in, in the context of Medina and Mecca and all of this, if, if, if that was the context and that was it, I understand trying to make this about all life forever. Many people say this is sacred scripture. It always talks to us. But if we understood it in that context, wouldn't that help people if they did get into that and say, hey, this isn't about us going and conquering the West or it's not about the West going and conquering this or it's not about this. It's this is the context, the historical context or is Muhammad was doing this in this situation. Maybe we could take away a lesson, but should we actually follow and act because he had tribal issues between him and other Qureshi or whoever they were? that therefore we should mimic this and imitate this in Europe or in whatever context that they're living in today. Right. It's that issue. You see what I'm trying to get right. at? Yes. Yes. So, so this is a, this is the perennial problem of scripture. Scripture uh, yeah, in, in the, in the monotheistic traditions in the scriptural monotheisms, 
the authority for everything is God, right? God is the ultimate authority for everything. Right. For your salvation, for your behavior, for how to live your life, how to pray, all this stuff. It's all, it's all, God is the ultimate authority. Problem is you can't get to God. You know, you, you can't just like call, call God up and just have a conversation. You can't, you, this, it just doesn't work. Now there's some people who feel that God is speaking to them. But oftentimes they can't convince other people that that's the case. It's just that's a kind of a personal thing. So for a community, how do you determine how to live your life? You have you you find out from God, but but God is not revealing anymore for most most communities. There are a few communities where there's ongoing revelation, but right. most Christian communities, Jewish communities, and Muslim communities, that's not happening. Scripture revelation is over it's canonized into a text that it has a beginning it has an end there's no more revelation after the canonization of that text so how do you make sense of what god wants well there are two basic ways to do that one is you look at the text and you say well maybe god meant something a little bit more deep than is obvious from this this particular verse so you go to great scholars and spiritual leaders who can tell you what God might have intended with this verse. That's scriptural interpretation. And we have that in all three of our monotheistic traditions. We have a tremendous amount of weight placed on how we interpret scripture. That's the reception history. How do we understand? What, what, did, what did God really mean when God said X, right? So, and, and, and that's exactly the, what, we're, what we're poised with here today. God, if God is an eternally uh, relevant essence and scripture is eternally relevant it must speak to us for what we're doing today right so we need to understand what was happening in seventh century arabia in terms of what it means today and so people have the right to interpret that material and say it means be militant or it means don't be militant right so so you're kind of stuck with that and you you don't really know you can't know but people can be very convincing in their interpretation. And then you can decide you're going to follow them. And that that's the way it works. If I may voice just my, my concerns as somebody who's not a religious person anymore, this is my struggle. I have my own jihad. Okay. And my, and I'm using the term for myself here. This is a serious struggle that I have on trying to be as fair, polite and continue conversations with those who are faithful to their literature and pointing out what I would say are, I'm going to use a, a, a kind term, and behind this term, there's a lot of meaning, uh, dated ideas. And when I say dated, I mean, for our context, I would say ugly and very, very not good practices, slavery, uh, you know, war, things that we still do sometimes today and in some parts of the world is still practiced. And I, and I ask, like, this is why I wonder if it's fundamentally the text or if it's the narrative spun. And how do we win this ideological war, whatever the position is, um, when we're dealing with a fundamental literature that says what it says or gives the impression um, that when you're reading it, like, for example, if I'm reading the Hebrew Bible, a lot of Christians today we'll say slavery doesn't mean slavery what what it means today um no it's like, almost like an ancient job and in some respects there is indentured servitude but what do we do about chattel slavery what do we do about sex slavery what do we do about these are bad things we would say today we don't practice those things and we shouldn't and can we do that with the quran can we do that with other literature can muslims actually say hey this is bad and i know some muslims do but are they, I'm asking you maybe as a scholar who might know this, are the voices that say this is bad rising? Are we growing in number that say, hey, slavery, no matter what, is bad and it shouldn't be practiced? You get my my, yeah, yeah. my yeah. jihad, right? <laughs> right, right. Are we, I, the Muslim world is confronted with the same problems that the Christian and the Jewish world are, are confronted with, with how we interpret our texts. And there are people that have different sensibilities and different understandings of how these things work. There's some people that feel very comfortable with slavery and they understand it and they can justify it. But a lot of people in the Muslim world don't feel comfortable with it. And assumptions about slavery are uh, kind of being re-examined. The, the good news is that there is so much interpretive tradition 
in Islam as well as in Judaism and Christianity that one can often find trends or threads that can be amplified that have some authority and can can push a new position. But remember that goes all ways. It goes both ways. You know, it goes in the way you want it to go and it goes in the way you don't want it to go. Because um because we're we're constantly being influenced by our environment and our social, economic and political situation and the those things influence the way we read because remember that we're always reading ourselves into the text that we're reading. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so you're never going to resolve the issue. Um Derek, it's going to be conflict. Uh, we're not yeah. going to solve the problem. I mean, that's why we wait for the Messiah. Right, right. right, right. Some, some <laughs> Messiah, a Jewish Messiah, a Christian Messiah, a Muslim Messiah. There are Messianic figures that we say we're going to hang in there and eventually there's going to be redemption of some sort. But we have to hang in there. We have to do the best we can while we can. I guess because I'm not waiting for a Messiah, I, I'm trying to be in some way participant in that process of trying to make things better um, and, and, and trying to understand. I think that's also another problem is like understanding. We can just cast people off for their beliefs and, and, and not try to understand them. There's a re- really well-known kind of story poet, like a, a proverb kind of story about the rooster and the wise man. And uh, if anybody who's ever read that, that's kind of what I'm trying to do. The, the king's son goes insane. And he literally is underneath the the kitchen table clucking like a rooster. And they're thinking they're going to have to lock him up on an island and throw away the key because there's just no way to get it. And this wise man's like, give me an opportunity to work with him. So the wise man literally gets undressed, becomes nude, gets under the table with him and starts clucking like a rooster. I know it sounds funny and it is funny, but it's like, and like the son who's insane is clucking with him. He starts getting familiar with him. He starts to understand the guy. The guy's starting to understand him. The next day they come out with food and, uh, or, or not food, but like clothing. And he's like, starts putting on clothes. He goes, Hey, roosters, the, the son's like, roosters don't put on clothes. He's like, Hey, look, I know I'm a rooster, but like, there's no reason I should be cold on this floor. Anyway, like one step at a time, he becomes human again. And the son becomes human at the end. Like he starts to come out of it, snaps out of it. And it, it was like, the more of the story is to try and become like the rooster to try and get others to follow on that path so that they don't stay clucking. And um, anyway, th- there's a little moral in my little thing. I did have one question. It's a, it's a controversial question, but it's, it's, it's something that maybe you can give me your opinion on. Uh, if not, you don't have to, you could literally say, Hey, I have no opinion on this, but it's about in the life of Muhammad. From what I understand, there were Jewish tribes that literally were killed Um, And this is debated even amongst some Muslims as well. But I've heard that some people think it's a bedrock historical account where he had killed many of of, of a Jewish tribe in his own life. Um, Do you think there's historical kernel to that? Just like we can argue about are the satanic versus historical or not. Um, It's a serious issue. um, But I wanted your opinion on this, if you don't mind giving it. Yeah, I know the story. I, I actually studied it. I, I worked on it. I've actually written about it a little bit and I, I have an opinion, but I, I don't that it's going to require a lot more discussion about right. um, the role of the Jewish community in Arabia before Islam emerged and the relationship between Jews and Muhammad and also Christians in the Arabian community before Islam emerged and their relationship with Muhammad. And that's very interesting uh, stuff. We know that there were Jewish and Christian communities there. We know something about them. Uh, a lot of this is conjecture. We don't know exactly what happened. I do believe that there was conflict between the Jewish community in Medina and Muhammad. I do believe that uh, from the evidence that cited that the, 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 Jew, the one Jewish tribe was massacred. I think also that um, if the Jews had won that fight, they would have done the same thing to the Muslims because right. they were playing with the same rules of engagement. And uh, but but it's complicated, and I I don't want to just touch on it so quickly now. I think it, it deserves yeah. a, a deeper dive. I do want to say, however, that the story about the 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 man and the rooster um, that's a Jewish rabbinic tale, Is it? A Jewish medieval tale, yeah. And I don't know how you learned it. It may not be only a Jewish tale. It could be other tales as well, but I learned it 
uh, as a Hasidic Jewish tale. And it's a, you know, it's a little bit different, but it's the same idea that you, you, you demonstrate a, a sense of empathy and association with someone and they're, then they're much more likely to, to be helped by you if you can do that rather than be above them or to push them in ways that feel really uncomfortable. Thank you. Q&A real quick here. Robert Mahaney, thank you so much for the super chat, the love. I did not see a comment from you or a question. Seriously, appreciate the support. Um, Mr. Morpheus says, talk about why did Abdullah ibn Said, is it Saad? Sorry, Saad ibn Abi Sar leave Islam and Uthman burning the Qurans? I don't know these stories. I don't know which, uh, which Uthman is burning the Qurans and which is Abdullah ibn Saad ibn Abi Shar, maybe. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know this one. And so I've heard that there was a burning of Qurans or early manuscripts that disagreed with the version. Oh, I see. You know, I see what you're talking and, about. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Canonization is taking place under Uthman. And right, right. We may yeah, even okay. have, uh, Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The, according to uh, the is Islamic tradition, there were a couple of attempts. The Quran was received as oral revelation, right? So God according to the Islamic tradition, God spoke to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. So Gabriel gave Muhammad revelations from God. Gabriel was the messenger. God, uh, Muhammad received those revelations and was instructed to go out and to declare them to the community, which he did. Uh, he didn't do it at the beginning. Uh, he, was, he was too anxious and nervous about it. Eventually he got up his, uh, his courage and he did. So, uh, so the Quran was received by the community of Muslims through an oral discourse. It was all oral. It was never written down uh, during the lifetime of the prophet. Now, there were some people who apparently wanted to remember, so they may have jotted down a note here and there. But even the orthographic system, that is the writing system for Arabic, was in the process of being developed. It was actually the Quranic experience that encouraged the development of, of Arabic writing. You can see in the earliest, earliest Qurans, they have a, a kind of rasam, they call it, which is a, a very minimal script that can be maybe understood in sometimes in several different ways and no vowels. And only later did it develop. So, so when Muhammad died, there was a kind of crisis in the community for many reasons. One is because the prophet died, but another one was, well, what about all of these, all of these revelations from God? Because while he, the prophet was alive, people could walk up to him and they could say, what did God say about X and Y? And, and Muhammad would remember, and he knew what he was told, so he could recite it back again. But that couldn't happen anymore. So the closest companions of the prophet and people who hung out with him a lot knew a lot of these revelations, but then they started dying and so during the, a couple of times, but the time it became successful, it was during the Caliphate of Uthman. Then he collected lots of witnesses and some of them brought their notes. They, they say they wrote them on stones or on camel bones, uh, just kind of mnemonic notes to try to remember the words of the Quran. And they went into seclusion for a couple of weeks or a few weeks. And then they came out with a document that they called the Quran. Now, there were other versions of the Quran as well, because other people had been doing that as well, or parts of it or whatever. Mm -hmm. So in order to have a kind of unified Quran, those variants were destroyed. Now, they were destroyed according to Islamic, uh, the, the Islamic narrative because they weren't accurate. That the, the ones, the only one that was accurate was the one that was produced by this group, this committee of people that came together and, and produced this Quran. And so the others were destroyed. Now, that's that has a lot of precedent in history. You know, many gospels were destroyed. You know, now in Nag Hammadi, we discovered a dozen other gospels yeah. that, that, that had a different view of what was going on there and had a different story of Jesus. So that happens. It's not just something that happened in the Muslim world. It happens in all uh, worlds where you have a an absolutely authoritative scripture. You need to know which one is the accurate one and which isn't. And that's that. That's what that story is about. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Morpheus. Gnostic Informant says, and thanks, Gnostic Informant. Go subscribe to his YouTube channel. How did the Zoroastrians survive throughout the centuries? And what was the initial response to Islam from the Zoroastrians in Sasanian Persia? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. I, I'm not an expert in this. I can tell you my impression of what happened. I mean, it, it survived for many centuries, but eventually it died out. I mean, there are very few Zoroastrians today. There's a small community in Iran. There's a small community in India. There's a small community in the United States and I think in Europe as well. Um, they're not very many and uh, they were not able to sustain their tradition in a way that um, Judaism, Christianity and Islam were able to do. Why is that the case? You have to ask historians uh, as, as to why. It's a it's a, it's a beautiful, complex, deep uh, tradition, uh, but, you know, some, you know, there are religions, new religions being birthed in every generation, and there are religions that are dying out in the world in every generation as well. So that's Thank all you, I can Neil. say about that. Appreciate you. And then Mr. Morphy said, Abdullah ibn Saad, ibn Abi Sar, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, was Muhammad's scribe, left Islam because after years he said Muhammad was a fraud. <laughs> Yeah, that's somebody's perspective. So I don't, I don't know. It, 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 I don't. I'm not familiar with that. I have. Uh, um, there were a few different scribes that Muhammad used at various times, and it could could possibly be. I just don't know this story. Mr. Morpheus, thank you again for the support. I hope that everybody watching will take the time to go check out our Patreon. Of course, help support us even more and access. Tons of content I've edited and worked very hard that is early, that is on there, and that may never see the light of YouTube. You have access to that. It's also a private community. And then get in your book, Jihad, The Origin of Holy War. You know, I, I was going to get into, like, literally down into each surah, of, like, which ones are more peaceful type surahs, different English translations of surahs, um, you know, which ones seem to be taken as, like, more all-out war, um, and then we're going to get into just to give a few little snippets of Matthew, right? Jesus in the gospel of Matthew, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, Luke 12. Um, I have come to bring fire on earth. This is Jesus talking, by the way, and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is comp completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five and one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. You get the point. And then, of course, you can read some stuff in the Psalms that, you know, can uh, talk this talk similar. But um, this is the book. Get the book. Derek, I, I want to just say one one more quick thing. I'm, I'm familiar with a different scribe, Zayd ibn Thabit. He was the guy who was involved in the collection of the Quran under Uthman, and he was Muhammad's personal scribe. But Muhammad had more than one, and, and it's possible that that's true, but I'm not familiar with it. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also mentioning the book we're going to talk about, and we might. It depends on how you feel uh, as far as when we want to do what. Holy War in Judaism. Um, specifically, I'm also curious about diving into the rabbis with you at some point, doing a deeper dive. You mentioned something that really sparked my interest earlier. Uh, I do want to do this, but also just the topic, how there are some, I'll call them anti-Semites, because I really think this is what some people are today. Um, and especially with what's going on with Kanye West and like crazy stuff that's happening. Um, there are some who read the Talmud, the Zohar, the reading in a fine, really hateful language from Jews towards Gentiles, 12th, 13th, 14th century literature, right? And in, in like, I've talked to another friend of mine who's Jewish, um, who's a scholar, expert, and specifically he deals with like ancient magic papyri and stuff. And he's like, if you knew the context of the hateful language that is being written by some of these Jews and how they're being treated by Gentiles, then you would understand why they're writing hateful language to Gentiles. They're not just out of nowhere. You know, I got a bad piece of pizza last night. I hate you Gentiles. Like, like there's a lot going on and they want to pick ugly things and then capitalize and say, 
hey, here's some modern bigoted rabbi because there are, there are bigoted extreme groups in whatever category you paint. And they want to like act like Jews all together. There's this conspiracy. So I'm hoping while we're doing academic work, we're also helping solve some of the world's problems with conspiracies. <laughs> that's that's my hope. Uh, me quacking like a duck here, a rooster. But uh, anyway, any final words from you, Dr. Firestone? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can do that. I'm hoping that you'll join me on that quest and uh, we can dive into other fields of research. So sure. Yeah. I appreciate your time. Thank you, audience. Like the video, share it out. Hopefully you learned something. If you did, let us know in the comment section. If you disagree, comment section. It's all there for you. And never forget, we are Myth Vision. Appreciate you. Bye.